Welcome to Andy Staples on three. Lots of news popping in the world of college football. The transfer portal is open. It's been open for more than 24 hours. Now, it has not been the Armageddon that was predicted by some, not here, of course, because we told you exactly what was going to happen, because we have Pete Nakos on our side, and he just knows what's up. But it is interesting. The, the most impactful, I'm going to predict right now, the most impactful transfer in the spring transfer portal window entered the transfer portal officially on Tuesday. The single most impactful player. I know you're, you're now you're racking your brain right now. I can tell you're racking. You're like, who, who the hell is Andy talking about? Who is that player? I tested this on our producer river before the show. I was like, it happened yesterday. I bet there will not be a more impactful player who enters the transfer portal this spring than this guy. And River's like, wait, wait. Now, Elijah Herring had a lot of tackles at Tennessee, but that's not, that's not who you're talking about. Like, no, no, that's not it. But the most impactful, like, drops into this position, takes over immediately, will make a huge impact, will make his team a lot better. In the transfer portal. It's a big deal. It just wasn't a big deal yesterday when this person officially entered because we already knew that they were going to enter and we already knew where they were going. The answer, of course, is Caden Proctor. Caden Proctor officially enters the transfer portal to leave Iowa because he's going back to Alabama. So Caden Proctor, remember, Kalen DeBoer gets hired at Alabama. Nick Saban retires. I realize the order's flip-flop there. Caleb Moore goes in the portal, goes to Iowa, where he was committed for most of his recruitment, where he's from, gets to Iowa, and is like, nah, I think I'd rather go back to Alabama. Now he's going back to Alabama. It's an interesting litmus test, the, the Caden Proctor thing, for the people who don't like the transfer rules as they are now. And I know, look, I'll be perfectly honest. I don't, I don't like the completely unlimited free agency where basically players can continuously hold their teams hostage. Like, I don't, I don't like that either, but it is funny because as the transfer rules were evolving, that you had your group of people who like, these guys need to understand the grass isn't always greener. And then you get when Caden Proctor goes to Iowa, realizes that grass is definitely not greener than Alabama, and decides to go back to Alabama like, this is what's wrong with the transfer portal. He's robbing their collective. He scammed them. Wait, 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 wait. You just said they shouldn't leave the first place because the grass isn't always greener, and now when they decide to go back to the first place, that's a problem too? I feel like you have, you're trying to have it both ways. Andrew in the chat. The grass is damn green, Eugene. Yeah, because it's artificial turf. You ordered it that color. You also have the dueling it never rains in Autzen Stadium, never rains in Tiger Stadium thing between, between Eugene and Baton Rouge. So, But yes, it is quite green. And in fact, depending on which stripe of the field you're on, one is greener than the other. There's a darker green and a lighter green, and they alternate. Other transfer portal news. Probably another, the the other biggest name that popped in on Tuesday so far, Jacoby Matthews, Texas A&M safety. Now he said back in February he was going to transfer. Now he told Steve Wil Steve Wiltfong yesterday that he's getting it narrowed down. Oregon and Florida State lead for Jacoby Matthews, former Texas A&M safety, who is one of those players who probably will go play somewhere and start immediately. So there's your there's your impact, guys. And there's, there's a few other impact guys that are coming in. Like, uh, we're starting to see these trickle in, and it will be interesting to see how many of these wind up in the portal. A couple of receivers, Colorado State's Justice Ross Simmons. He was their third leading receiver with 45 catches, 724 yards, three touchdowns. He's the type that could come in and play somewhere, and it does definitely 
sting for Colorado State to lose him. And then Houston receiver Sam Brown, who led the team last season with 62 catches, 815 yards, three TDs. They had a coaching change at Houston. He's looking elsewhere. He's another one who could probably help out. And, and you know, we'll see a few more of those. But the question is how many? And it's, it's really a test of the collectives at a lot of these schools. How well did you lock down your, your better players to retain the better players? Like right? the, the guys we talked to from UCF last week, like RJ Harvey, that's a guy who I'm sure everybody would love to have a 1,400 yard back. But from what I've been told, their collective did a great job of making sure he's not going to go anywhere. And that's the that's the thing. Have the collectives evolved to the point where they understand the market and they can provide enough so that the player feels like they're getting good market value. They don't really need to look elsewhere. De Niro in the chat says, do you think some of the Alabama players overreacted and left too quick? Well, Caden Proctor certainly does because he came back. Caleb Downs seems to be staying at Ohio State. So I don't I don't know if they're getting him back. That would be a very big deal if if he decided to come back, but it seems like he's he's at Ohio State and that's where he's going to play. So Caden Proctor absolutely probably thought he he reacted too quickly. I think a lot of it also had to do with we went on spring break with some some teammates from Alabama and and they were telling him, "Hey, it's it's pretty great here now. New coaching staff doing a good job." And you, you'd probably like it. So he's coming back. But that is the most impactful, I am predicting, the most impactful transfer in the spring window. I think we've already seen it. I think that person's already in the portal. And I think we know where he's going. It's Caden Proctor leaving Alabama or leaving Iowa after leaving Alabama and going back to Alabama. Meanwhile, you had nine Colorado players into the portal. Also a 10th, Cormani McLean, the corner, who was a big-time recruit in the class of 2023, he announced that he is headed somewhere else in the transfer portal. That was an interesting one. Now, it was not interesting from the standpoint of, I can't believe they didn't keep him. I'm not surprised at all that he's in the portal. He didn't immediately become a star there. And given the level of recruit he was, you thought he'd be able to get on the field pretty quickly and, and make a big contribution pretty quickly. But listening to what Deion Sanders said about Cormani McLean over the course of last season, doesn't sound like he was making that big of an impact. It sounds like there, there needed to be some more work done. And so I don't, I don't know that relationship was, was going to be salvaged at that point. So Cormani McLean be looking elsewhere and this is one of those cases where this is a guy that everybody wanted as a recruit but he got to a place where he should have uh, you know being a recruit of that that caliber should have been able to almost start immediately or at least play a, a massive role immediately and that wasn't the case so he's gonna find almost anywhere he goes that that's going to be an issue so we'll see what happens with Cormani McLean the more interesting part is Colorado which that they had all these guys hit the portal is not surprising. This is how they operate. And in fact, I would say more teams are copying the model that Coach Prime used last year than not copying it. The, so we're going to see this, guys who aren't playing going into the portal, and that's, that's what's going on in Colorado right now. But we had a lot of fun on the internet on Tuesday night because – Shiloh Sanders, Deion Sanders' son, who plays safety for the Buffaloes, put on his Instagram story, hey, contact me if you're a defensive transfer. Offensive transfers DM Shadur Sanders. And I'm just thinking, dang, Coach Prime has deputized his sons as assistant player personnel people. That is impressive. That is corporate synergy right there. That is also like there, there are people in the organization who do that. Like at Georgia, the best players on defense don't have to do that. The quarterback, that Carson Beck's not like, hey, offensive transfers, come DM me. Now, is that how it happens? Absolutely. So I'm not going to poke too much fun here because this is how this works. The good players do talk to one another and they do help in recruiting. 
it's just funny because this looks like these guys are acting as Colorado's player personnel department, which they are not. But I, I don't have a lot of optimism for Colorado this year. And I, I realized I was pretty high on Dion last year. I wanted to, to give him the benefit of the doubt. I liked the, the way that he hired his staff going into last year. I don't necessarily like the changes they've made this year. They, they have moved from an offense that will help you when you have a really good quarterback, but you don't have a great offensive line to an offense that kind of requires a good offensive line and they haven't gotten any better on the offensive line. So I don't know that Shador Sanders is going to be as good as he was early in the season last year because I don't know that he's going to have as much time or let's put it a different way. The Sean Lewis offense that they were running at the beginning of last season before Dion panicked and switched didn't require that much time for the quarterback to get the ball out. So I'm not particularly confident about this. I'm also not confident because they've not really recruited that well from the high school level at Cormani McLean. Good example. One of the guys they got that Colorado would not normally have been able to get before Deion Sanders, he's already gone and he didn't really make an impact. They've got Jordan Seaton this year, who is the number one offensive line prospect. We'll see if he gets on the field early. But that's going to have to happen. Some of those players are going to have to be able to, to come in and play. And then, you know, the guys out of the portal, they didn't really get guys that everybody else in the world wanted. You know, you can have a highly ranked portal class just because you signed a bunch of players. You got to go for the average ranking. You got to take a look at that and see where they fall. But I'm not very optimistic about this. And I realize that's probably bad for business because Dion clicks and everybody wants to hear about Dion and talk about Dion. And I just, I don't know how they got any better. You got to explain to me how they got better because they're going into a league where pretty much everybody they play is as good or better than them. Like the Big 12 is a very evenly matched, balanced league. And I just don't, I don't see it. I don't see it. Yosef says, I wouldn't be surprised if Dion left after this upcoming season. I wouldn't either. Because Shador's going to the NFL. Travis Hunter's going to the NFL. Presumably Shiloh's going to the NFL. So they're not building for something that would be good two and three years down the road. But they're not really building for this year either. Because... It's really hard to do that in the transfer portal. You know, we, we keep talking about who needs what. And we're going to talk about Texas and Oklahoma today. We're going to talk about how SEC ready Texas and Oklahoma are or aren't as they go into this season where they're going to be in the SEC. They wrap up spring practice this week, both of them. If you said, Steve Sarkeesian, Brent Venables, what do you need? Steve Sarkeesian would be like, D-line. Brent Venables would be like, o line and D-line. Like, if you had to get anybody out of the portal, what would you get? Those are the things they'd get. Well, that's what Colorado needs, too. But unfortunately, if Texas and Oklahoma need them, guess where the really good players are going to go? Yeah. And oh, by the way, USC needs them. Oregon needs them. Miami needs them. Everybody needs those players. Georgia would like a few more. Alabama would like a few more. De Niro says, you didn't see the big upgraded offensive line. No, I, 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 don't, I don't know if you're telling me there was an upgrade, but I'm telling you there wasn't. It's about the same. We'll see what happens, but I'd say it's a bad look to have your players essentially acting as your personnel department. And I think the reason we we're laughing at this and poking fun at this is Dion's unwillingness to do the things you have to do to actually recruit and build a really good team. Like he says, I can't go to a school. I'm too famous. People would be mad because I went to this school and not to this school. Kirby smarts really famous in Georgia. He goes to schools. Nick Saban was really famous. He went to schools. Like <laughs> That's how it works. And Dion, if he wanted to, 
could be the single best recruiter in college football. Absolutely could be the best recruiter. If Dion shows up at your house, Dion shows up at your school, Colorado is on your list. Colorado is one of your finalists. And that is a massive superpower. And he ain't using it. He's not using it. Instead, you got Shiloh on the Instagram story saying, DM me. You're in the portal, DM me. And I, the best part is, this isn't last chance you in the at the bottom. <laughs> Basically saying, if you're a behavior problem, if you've been kicked off your old team, like, we don't want you. We want people who can play. Here's the problem. Everybody else does too. And they're probably going to get them instead. One more thing before we talk Texas and Oklahoma and SEC readiness. Texas and Oklahoma, in an, in an alternate universe, could have wound up in something called the Southwest Division. What is that, you ask? Well, remember we talked about that Super League plan that was put forth by the number two from the NFL and Len Perna, who runs the biggest search firm that, that services the college sports industry. They talked about a Super League. It was essentially the FBS and essentially the power conferences as they exist now, which if there's a Super League, that's not how that will work because everybody won't make the cut. They were trying a, a kind of blue sky thing where everybody did make the cut. And I, I, I shudder to think that somebody got paid for this, but somebody did get paid for this. This is from the pitch deck that they presented to different people, movers and shakers. Daniel Lilbit from Sportico got this, put it out on Tuesday. And it's the proposed divisions for this Super League. And oh my, these are not good. now. Recreating the Pac-12 or the Pac-10, perfect. That's fine. That's your West Division. The Southeast Division, or excuse me, the South Division, which is basically the SEC, except Georgia Tech gets to come back into the SEC. That's not bad either. The Southeast Division, which is the ACC, except South Carolina is back in the ACC, and you've added UCF and Florida. I'm pretty sure... Florida State, which is suing to get out of the ACC, and Clemson, which is suing to get out of the ACC, don't want to be with those teams, hence the lawsuits. And then Florida, yeah, you're going to take them from the, the conference they've been a charter member of and, and dump them in with the conference that their rival is suing to get out of. I don't know if that's going to work. And then, like, here's your Midwest division. Cincinnati, Illinois, Indiana, Louisville, Michigan, Michigan State, Missouri, Northwestern, Ohio State, and Purdue. So this is your way of keeping Michigan State, Michigan, and Ohio State together. Ugh. No, no. But this also demonstrates some of the pitfalls of trying to do a league, Super League, with everybody now. The thing that makes a Super League super is better teams. And more games between better teams. And the way to do that is you have fewer teams. So that's the part that is probably coming. But the reason this thing was DOA is you look at this and you say, okay, if I'm the Big Ten, if I'm the SEC, I've worked for all these decades to create a massive advantage over these, these other leagues. Why would I share equally with the other leagues, with the teams in the other leagues? I, would, I want to share equally with the teams in my league, and I want to make them better, and I want to have them have the most money so they can be better than these other teams. That's what's happening, and that's what's going to happen going forward. It's going to be unpleasant, probably, and people are going to get left on the side of the road. But this was, it was, I, I commend them for trying to come up with something that would keep this as broad and wide of a sampling of teams as possible. But that's not, that's not what would work for a TV program or like they couldn't get anybody in TV on their side. And there's a reason for that. Like here's the division Notre Dame's in the Northeast division, Boston college, Maryland, Notre Dame, Penn state, Pittsburgh, Rutgers, Syracuse, Virginia, Virginia tech, West Virginia. Nobody at Fox 
or ESPN is going to fall in love with that division. They're going to fall in love with my moonshine division from that 48-team Super League that I did a few months ago. But the problem is, and I hated doing that one because who I had to leave out and making those choices at the bottom was brutal. But that's probably what's going to happen. So it's coming sooner rather than later. These schools have to figure it out. You've got the house case happening now. House versus the NCAA and the conferences. Keep watching that one. That's the one that could cause a lot of the big changes. All right. Speaking of big changes, Texas and Oklahoma are headed to the SEC. They are wrapping spring practice this week. Huge expectations, especially for the Longhorns. Longhorns, one of four teams in the country that have a win total at FanDuel of 10 and a half. They and Georgia are the only two SEC teams at that level. Essentially, those two are your favorites in the SEC going into the season. It's going to be fascinating to watch this transition. E the team's coming in from different places. Texas made the playoff last year. Oklahoma was much better in year two than it was in year one under Brent Venables, but not quite what they want to be. But Oklahoma did beat Texas. So both of them coming in, expecting to be competitive immediately in the SEC. But Texas, I think, is the one that we're watching that we think could be maybe the best team in the SEC. We'll see. Georgia's going to still be really good. Alabama's still going to be really good. We'll find out about LSU. We'll find out about Tennessee. Find out about Ole Miss. But Texas looking very strong. We talked with Bobby Burton about the Longhorns as they wrap up spring practice. We are joined now by the great Bobby Burton on Texas football, which, by the way, you can watch on the On Texas Football YouTube channel right after this show ends each morning. Football and coffee with Bobby. <laughs> I was enjoying that show on Tuesday, watching as as the Longhorns sort of examine the transfer portal. But Bobby, I I don't know what Texas needs to do. It's, this roster feels pretty complete right now. It, it, it's good. It's a good roster, Andy. And thanks for having me, uh, by the way. And, and the the so nice intro there that you that you gave me. Um, look. The Longhorns should be set at quarterback. They've got a really deep roster there. Everybody knows about Quinn Ewers and Arch Manning, but uh, they went out to the portal and grabbed some good receivers. Their secondary is better. Uh, you know, the one spot that I would caution Longhorn fans about and that Longhorn fans are quite obviously concerned about is replacing an Outland Trophy winner in Tavondre Sweat, as well as a potential first-round draft pick in Byron Murphy at defensive tackle. Uh, Texas just needs to, if they can get one or two guys out of the portal that can make an impact, I think this roster is more stacked or would be more stacked overall last year. And you're talking about a team that may have six picks coming up uh, in the top 100 uh, picks in the NFL draft. So uh, the Longhorns are, are really in good shape right now. They'd like to be in better shape, just like every other team in the country. Yeah, I, the, it's it's tricky because – those interior defensive linemen were such a huge difference. The edges look fine. And then, uh, of course, you can bring in, you know, bring Anthony Hill down and, and have him rush the passer as well. I mean, it feels like they, they've got that, but you're right. The, the interior D line, and that is something when you get into the SEC, when you're playing the Georges of the world, like that's a critically important piece of it. But I, I look at what they did with the rest of the roster, like just getting Amari Nye Black. When you lose JT Sanders at tight end, like that is a is a kind of perfect replacement where I don't know that a lot of other schools were able to do that when they lost somebody that good. You know, you're right. Um, but Sark has done that at the offensive skill positions every year. I mean, last year he added Adonai Mitchell, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Nye Black and Isaiah Bond this year, Matthew Golden from Houston, Silas Bolden from Oregon State. Um, and he's developed the quarterback, right? Now a three-year starter, Quinn Ewers will be. He's got a quarterback in the pipeline. Texas may have, and a lot of people don't realize this, but B. B. John Robinson was a first-rounder last year, right? 
Well, Texas may have the first running back off the board in 2020, the 2024 draft as well. And Jonathan Brooks yet, yet I say that Jonathan Brooks actually wasn't the starter to begin the season. It was a true freshman out of Orlando named Cedric Baxter, who is back yep. next, at this coming year is in healthy. So, you know, Sark in offensive skill position, I mean, he's just lining them up and knocking them down. The rest of the team is where this thing has to play out and they have to kind of rise to the level of everybody else. Well, and an offensive line feels like it's where it needs to be. This is one, this is the the come to fruition moment for that big offensive line class from a few years ago. Obviously, Kelvin Banks has been a star since he stepped foot on campus, but the rest of them as they age into their spots and and are experienced now. I, that's the thing I talking to people from around the country and we've been doing a lot of these you know as teams get to their spring games examining the rosters other than interior defense line which like you said is inexperienced i just don't see a ton of holes here no there's not there's not amy but but here's the question no holes doesn't mean great team right it means a team that's hard to beat but it doesn't mean they're going to be a 10 11 12 win team great teams uh, are better than the sum of their parts, right? Um, and I think that's what Texas actually did last year. They were better than the sum of their parts, even though they're going to have these six guys picked uh, in the top 100, uh, we think. So I, I look uh, look at it overall. Uh, you mentioned the big offensive line group. They signed seven offensive linemen uh, two and a half years ago now. Uh, three of those guys will start this year, perhaps a fourth. Um and so that big pancake factory offensive line is coming to fruition. By the way, the other group of that, the other three or four, they're all second team. So that has been a huge uh, boon to this, the program. Kyle Flood, the former uh, head coach at Rutgers, prior to, to Alabama and now at Texas, uh, has done a miraculous job alongside Steve Sarkeesian in that regard. So, I look, nobody's going to cry over spilled milk for Texas, um, and nor should they. Uh, but are they a great team? We, we just don't know. Saturday, yeah. the spring game coming up, we'll see a little bit more of them. Well, the thing that makes me feel better about Texas from year to year, and I, I, this is what I said I needed to see going into last year and then, then it happened, is they figured out a way to turn those big-time recruits that they keep signing into NFL players. And, and you look at it, like Byron Murphy and Tavondre Sweat are prime examples of that. Those are guys that went through it. And Murphy more naturally has the tools, has the gifts, the skill set. Devondre Sweat developed into it. But then the offensive lineman this year, like Kelvin Banks is going to be a first-round pick next year. Uh, like you mentioned, there's other offensive linemen from that class who are going to start, like DJ Campbell. We, we don't know if they're going to be NFL guys next year, but they might be NFL guys the year after that and, and probably decently highly drafted. What are they doing differently? than these previous coaching staffs in terms of turning them into something more than what they started with. I, I don't mind saying this and, and it's uh, every Texas fan knows it. The 2010s, it felt like it's where Texas is where five stars went to die. Huh? You know, it was, yeah. it was a, it was a proposition where they just didn't pan out very often. Uh, what Steve Sarkeesian's done is turn that on its head completely. Uh, you mentioned uh, Kelvin Banks. Well, don't forget about Quinn Ewers and don't forget about JT Sanders and Xavier yeah. Worthy. You know, all yeah. five star type players that are now leading the team. And at the same time, uh, they're developing guys, Andy, to your point, right? They're developing guys to be uh, drafted, high draft picks, uh, whether they're uh, three stars or four stars. They're coming in and assimilating to the program. The strength and conditioning coordinator at Texas, uh, guy by the name of Tory Becton, used to be at Cal under Justin Wilcox prior to going to Texas three years ago with Sark. Uh, they've just done a good job. And I think that I, I also want to give a hat tip to the Texas coaches. I mean, they've a lot of there's always it always seems like uh, when guys don't pan out, it seems like there's a lot of carousel among the assistant coaches. Oh, this guy had four different running backs coach. This guy had four different defensive back coach or three different defensive coordinators over a four-year period. And so the players 
aren't in a situation where they can actually mature and become the best version of themselves as they get stronger, as they get faster. And Sark uh, and his coaching staff, they've been pretty, I mean, there's been only two or three moves in a three-year period. That's uh, kind of unheard of in college football these days. Yeah. Yeah, they've done a good job keeping everybody together, but also replacing them. I mean, like you, you lose Bo Davis, Kenny Baker comes in. We'll see how he keeps, you know, wh where they can keep that up on the D-line, but I, I would imagine they can. Uh, this is an interesting spring game situation. Now, weather dependent because it, it may be bad weather in Austin on Saturday, but this is one of those, like, they don't need a spring game. They have an experienced roster. Everybody's going to be excited because they're going to the SEC and they got a good team coming back. They don't need a spring game, but I will say this. Like, typically when you have an experienced team, what, what do you get to see the most of in the spring game? The backup quarterback. This could be <laughs> Arch Manning's showcase, and I would like to watch that. Uh, I, I got to tell you this. So the question I posed to the community on the our YouTube channel, uh, Andy, was how many series does uh, Quinn Ewers get on Saturday? You yeah. know, it's, like, it's an over and under of four, right? <laughs> he might see some time. Uh, but, yes, it'll be the first time where you see extended action of Arch Manning with the first unit outside of game um and you know he's a uh, he's he's been a guy that is i i would love to say that you know he's this guy that that uh has had um all these problems he loses his id and he's just <laughs> but here's the reality he's not i mean everybody i talk to say he's just one of the guys he gets along great with folks he's personable um, it, it's easy to root against guys that you think maybe have been handed everything to them all their lives. And then this guy comes in and frankly, I mean, he's one of the guys that everybody on the team just loves. And so even though he's a backup, it, it, it pretends well, in my opinion, Andy, not just for this year for Texas, but in years to come, because, uh, I think the Longhorns have not one, but at least two quarterbacks on campus right now, they're going to be NFL players. Well, and the willingness to wait the turn, which we don't always see from, from highly rated quarterback recruits. Usually, you know, a, a lot of times we see, okay, if I'm not playing by year two, I'm out of here. Or if I'm not, you know, guaranteed a starting job, I'm out of here. That's not what this has been. And look, it, if we're being realistic about it, Quinn Ewers has been the starter for two years at Texas. He's missed games in each of those years. So if you're the backup at Texas, there's a really good chance you're going to play. With different injuries both years. Yeah. By the way. So it's not like, uh, you know, it's it's not that. So you are going to play, I think, the SEC um, going into a tougher, uh, more physical conference probably will mandate that as well. Uh, you look at the schedule uh, right now, and they even go up to Michigan, the second game of the year in Ann Arbor. I can guarantee you that uh, Michigan is not going to be, you know, unphysical <laughs> in one year removed yeah. from uh, Jim Harbaugh. So uh, all in all, uh, Texas has to make this transition to the SEC, uh, and they're going to do it with a full roster and a, a very talented one. There are certain pieces, to your point, uh, where they still need to attack, I think, in the transfer portal. And, and I think you'll see that over the next week to two weeks, even three weeks, uh, where Texas goes heavily, uh, potentially, at defensive tackle. So – I saw this the other day. That I think it was when Travis Scott visited the team at practice. And I was talking about this with some people. He's wearing the jersey, and the jersey's got the SEC patch on it. And it was the first time I'd seen that at, for Texas or Oklahoma. And it was one of those, like, oh, wow, that feels real moments. Like, when you see something like that, or when you see we, – we just popped up the schedule. When, when you see – Florida and Georgia coming to Texas for for conference games. You know, you see them playing Texas A and M again. Does it does it start to really sink in that this this is going to be extremely different? Well, I, Andy, I got to. I'll just relay what you and I were talking about before we went on air. Uh, you know, I'm talking about trying to, what am I going to do for my schedule personally during all these games, and I'm talking about oh well, Florida's coming to town. Well, guess who we're going to try to have on the show? We're going to try to get somebody like Emmett Smith. I mean, that that <laughs> that's just that's awesome, right? If yeah. You're a Texas fan, and you know the Cowboy connection there, and a great NFL player, great college player, two great college programs. 
fine universities, same with Georgia, and then you renew with Arkansas and a and I mean, bringing back a and it's been 13 years. Um, and, you know, I, I just, look, you look at that schedule and it, particularly from Oklahoma on, and if your heart doesn't skip a beat and you're a Texas fan, I don't know what you're feeling. Because that, that's what Plus, you get at Vandy. You get the oh. trip to Nashville. The because Austin, Austin will now be the trip that every SEC fan wants to make. But the at Vandy was the one that everybody always loved before because you get you get your you know get your kicks on Broadway and then you get to watch a game the next day. Well, not just watch a game, you get a W. <laughs> <laughs> that too. That too. But yeah, you don't have to worry about waking up with a hangover because you can actually watch the game in, without a hangover in Vander at Advantage. No, I think you'll take I over the stadium more than likely. Yes, yes. It's a it's a home away from home for a lot of people. I, I so it, my, it's gonna my my thought, and and you t correct me if I'm wrong, is you know, the, the SEC is the pinnacle of college football. It has been from a fan perspective, fan interest perspective, and Texas and Oklahoma, they definitely feel that and want to participate in that. And, you know, they're ready. They're ready to be part of it. And uh, I, I, I laugh because my cohort, Rod Babers, who played at Texas, uh, he, he co-hosts a show with us uh, on Texas football. He always he already has a Texas logo with an SEC logo, somebody, some kind of like, uh, you know, counterfeit hat that one of his friends made, right? <laughs> and every okay. single time he wears that on our show, he gets asked, where'd you get that hat? Where'd you get that hat? Oh, yeah. You know, and I know Chris Del Conte, the athletic director at Texas, is saying, you know, sitting back there saying, ah, wait until June, wait until June. There's going to be plenty of plenty of stuff. So, like, when you're talking about with Travis Scott and the SEC logo, I, I do think it means a lot. Um, I think the teams are going to be playing, some of the like-minded institutions and sized institutions. I mean, Texas needs to be playing Florida and Georgia not Iowa State and Kansas, per se. Well, and, and, and Texas also needs to be playing Arkansas yeah. because that's a fun old rivalry that gets rekindled. And I will tell you, so about the, the merchandise, there's a belt. And it existed before A&M and Missouri joined the league. It was a, it was a belt that had all of the, the team logos and an SEC logo on it. It was, it was an outrageous back. Like, you know, this is 2010. It was outrageously priced back then. It was like 140 bucks back then. God only knows what it costs now. They've added A&M and Missouri logos. I'm sure this company has started making the ones with Texas and OU logos as well. I bet those SEC belts will be very hot sellers in the States of Texas and Oklahoma over the next few months. <laughs> Well, I I don't know what's going to be sell the best, but the the Longhorn Silhouette logo is one of the most uh, renowned in the country, uh, along with the SEC logo. I, I just look, I I think that uh, it's uh, it's about time for Texas. The Big Twelve had seen its better years uh, after Nebraska, Colorado, A and M, uh, even Missouri left, um, and so for Texas, I think that. Uh, Moving into the SEC with a team that's as talented as they are, to your point, uh, gives gives uh, Texas fans a lot of hope. Plus, coming off what they came into, uh, what they did last year, Andy. You know, we everybody said Texas is back before. Well, they they weren't really. You know, last year they proved that they could compete with the very best in the country. And so, my take on it is uh, the Longhorns are sitting in a, a situation right now where you know it's. They don't even know what – a lot of Texas fans don't even know what to think right now about this schedule because, look, we've been playing host to Kansas and Kansas State and Iowa State where they may bring some fans to campus and, and to Austin, but they're not going to be there in fifteen to 20,000 waves like we hope we see from the SEC teams, right? And so uh, I, I feel like that – we hope that that uh, – that that really resonates with the Texas fan base. I do because I think um, it can really take Texas football even to a to a higher level than it already is. Well, it's going to be a lot of fun, and hopefully the weather will be clear enough to to get a good look at Arch Manning working with the ones and the twos on Saturday. Bobby, thank you so much on Texas football. 
If you are a Texas fan and you are not already subscribed to the On Texas Football YouTube channel, now's your chance because it is a great community they're building there. Thank you so much, Bobby. All right, hook them in. Thank you, buddy. The Longhorns, very good reason to be excited. Very good reason. They're coming in with all the hype. Meanwhile, Oklahoma on the other side of the Red River, not coming in with as much hype yet. Obviously, Oklahoma has been one of the most successful programs in America throughout the history of college football. Like, I'm not underselling that. I'm not understating that. Oklahoma is one of the few programs that is rarely ever down. Ohio State's the other one. What happens when the Sooners hit the SEC this year? What happens as the Sooners wrap up spring practice? What happens with the Sooners in the portal? Because it looks like they're doing some shopping as folks enter the transfer portal. We talked to Eddie Radosevich and George Story III from Sooner Scoop about Oklahoma as they wrap their spring practice. Bunch of teams wrapping up spring practice this week. One of those is the Oklahoma Sooners. Their spring game is Saturday. Eddie Radosevich, George Story III from Sooner Scoop joining me now. We got to talk. Sooners entering the SEC, spring practice, and also, well, let, let's just cut to the chase, boys. What's going on with the offensive line? <laughs> oh, boy. What a great if, start. If if we had, uh, like, any money to show for uh, any knowledge about what's going on, it, it's not been good. I think that uh, those kind of problems have kind of seeped into uh, the larger picture of just in terms of, uh, you know, the fact that the, the – Troy Everett injury was obviously uh, at an awful time. It's good news that he's not going to be out for the season. But at the same time, you look at an offensive line that was having to reshuffle quite a few positions, uh, guys that were coming in as uh, you know mid mid year transfers. Uh, it's gone probably good, but I would say I wouldn't characterize it as a bunch of guys that have stepped in and just really certainly wowed a lot of people. I think Fabechi Wewewu from North Texas has certainly uh, kind of locked down one of the guard positions, but the overall picture of the Oklahoma offensive line coming out of spring is probably not something that would uh, bring a lot of praise from the Oklahoma fan base. And that's where you get into like the bigger questions about like, has Jackson Arnold been able to develop because the offensive line has been so bad throughout the spring? I don't know. It's, it's been a big question mark. I think the biggest thing, Andy, is they, I mean, having to replace five guys is difficult. And I think they like some of the pieces they have, but all of a sudden, you lose your guy that you were expecting to start at center and Troy Everett to a knee injury. And, and it sounds like they, they hope to have him back by the start of the season. We'll see. They're bringing in uh, Branton Hickman, the transfer from SMU this weekend, who's very experienced at center. I, I would assume they will take him if they can get him. Um, you know, And then you look at the the guard spots. You've had some nice play from, like Eddie said, Fabici, uh, Wiwu, and then Heath Ozeda, who's a second-year guy, Jacob Sexton, who was playing – Right tackle last year. Sounds like they've moved him to guard, maybe. Um, you've got Michael Tarquin from USC to transfer. He's been playing some left tackle. And then that right tackle spot, they thought Spencer Brown from Michigan State was going to be a plug-and-play type guy. That has not been the case. And so you're talking about every position still fills up for grabs. You were hoping that maybe after spring, some of these guys would lock down some of these spots. And it sounds like other than WeeWoo, they haven't really had anybody that's kind of come in and said, this is going to be my starting spot. So uh, I think that they have a lot of question marks. And and look, I, I think that some of it is... It all spring. comes with a qualifier, too, yeah. because of the way the Bill Bidabo process He tinkers everything. with guys. He moves guys around different positions. And so they still have some time, but we also expect them to go out in the portal here in the spring and try, try to add at least probably two guys. Yeah, and that's the hardest thing to do right now as we look at... You know, the, the portal's been open for a little bit now, and we're looking at the guys who are coming in. And, and it's funny because... Before we got on the air, I was like, I was talking to you guys and I said, Oh, you know, Arkansas has a tackle in the portal. And and you caught me and you're like, Well, no, hey, no, he can't come if he wants to play. Because Oklahoma now in the SEC, now following the SEC rule that if you played at an SEC school last year, you can't transfer in the spring and play right away at another SEC school. So it it also limits the pool of what they can take. Yeah, and, and that's been, you know, something I, I remember I called um the SEC offices, like I think it was like a couple months ago, and it was just like, "Hey, what's the clarification on this rule for OU in Texas?" And they just said, "Hey, oh o boy, this guy again." Yeah, they said, "Hey, OU in Texas, they are currently abiding by the rules, even though they're not officially league members till July first. 
they have to abide by these rules. And so any of these guys that are entering from SEC schools, I know there's been, you know, some defensive linemen, I think from Ole Miss or Texas A&M. And, you know, you mentioned the the offensive tackle from Arkansas, like uh, people on our board are like, oh, well, oh, you should go after him. It's like they can go after him and get him, but they can't play next year, you know, based on SEC rules. So it, that limits the pool tremendously. And, and there hasn't been a ton of guys in the portal on the offensive line, especially that I think that, OU is particularly interested in right now, other than, like I said, Branson Hickman from SMU that, you know, he started 33 games there at center. So there, I think they're still waiting and seeing maybe some guys will pop here in the next couple of weeks. Um, you never know, but uh, it, right now it's definitely a limited group. Well, and George, I hope you didn't call Birmingham on the same day I did. So shout, shout out Chuck Dunlap and her Vincent at the SEC and, and, <laughs> For, and William King also for uh, for clarifying those rules for us because uh, that that is one of those things that like you don't think about Oklahoma and Texas do not officially join until July first so you got to figure out how everything works. Um, besides that, the, you know that side of the line of scrimmage, I know defensive line is a position where they, they feel pretty good about the first line guys, but how about depth? Yeah, and I think that's going to be the biggest question mark, and especially when in terms of guys that enter the portal here over the next 14, 15 days, is if you have experience, if you fit kind of a, a mold of a roster of, of obviously over 300 pounds, I think Oklahoma's probably going to take a look at you. I, I think that they feel pretty good about the uh, depth that they've been able to build. But once again, it's a bunch of guys that have simply not played a whole lot of college football, specifically and obviously when you're talking about uh, the two defensive linemen that came in as true freshmen and David Stone and Jane Jackson from IMG. Uh, but at the same time, I think that we've heard some good things about Devon Sears, who returns uh, to Oklahoma this next season. We've heard good things about Grayson Holton, but they haven't really been able to uh, really take that next step on the field. And I think that there is a big question mark is in terms of what is behind some of these frontline guys that Oklahoma is going to throw out. Because everywhere else on the defense, every level, it seems, George, is really, really good from a depth perspective. I think the biggest thing, Andy, is right now they have they want to have a six man rotation on that defensive line, and, and you have DJ Terry who played a lot of snaps last year up front, and you feel really good about him. But they lose Jacob Lacey for the season due to blood clots; he's going to be out. They were really counting on him starting next year and being that guy. I mean, he played the most snaps of any defensive tackle last year for Oklahoma. So now you're trying to replace that with you know either a young freshman like Jaden Jackson who has had a really good spring and, and is, is probably ahead of where anybody anticipated, and, and David Stone, too. I think David Stone has done a really nice job. Uh, you, then you have a bunch of guys that are, you know, David, De Devon Sears, you've got Grayson Hall, and you've got, you know, Ashton Sanders, Marcus Strong, guys that just haven't played but have been in the program for a couple years. So I think Oklahoma looks at the portal and says, if we can go out and get a guy that's, you know, been a two-year starter, has played some, you know, quality snaps, whether that's at the Power 5 level or the Group of 5 level, they just need somebody that has, has some football experience because you're talking about guys that, they like, they think they have good potential, but no one's really played that much football. Yeah, it, it, that's, I think that's the fear coming into the league. You know, the SEC being a heavy line of scrimmage league, you, you worry that if, if you don't feel comfortable having a two deep D line rotation, if you don't feel like you have eight offensive linemen who can play, that's where it gets a little dicey. With this roster, I'm, I'm trying to think, you know, Brent Venables came in and, and started remaking the roster pretty quickly through the transfer portal. How different is the roster now than, say, when they decided they were going to go to the SEC? I think it's tremendously different. I mean, night and day I mean, from what it was. But again, especially on the defensive side, from where it was, yeah. obviously was so far below the, uh, you know, the bar of what Oklahoma needs to be or should be that they had to kind of dig themselves out. And they seemingly have done that when we've been able to go out to practice here over the last couple of weeks. I, I would even say, I mean, defensively, we just went through the defensive line and said they would like to add one or two guys. I still think the defensive line is ahead of where they were, you know, just a few years ago. Sure. When you look at the body types and, and the talent level of these guys, the ceilings that they could have. Now they're, they're young and they're inexperienced, but... I think they have way more talent up front than they did a few years ago. And then you and then you just go down the line. I mean, linebacker, we know Danny Stutzman, Kip Lewis, Kobe McKenzie, Jaron Kanick, Lewis Carter, Samuel Masigo, Desan McCall. I mean, they have so many guys that could be starters elsewhere at linebacker. I mean, it's it's pretty incredible 
corners the same way and, and, and even safety. And those are some positions that we've kind of looked at and said, we wouldn't be shocked if some of these guys entered the spring portal just because the number situation, they don't know how they're going to get all these guys onto the field because they have so many bodies. And then I think on the offensive side, the quarterback room is certainly better than what it was in terms of having, you know, Jackson Arnold, you bring in Casey Thompson, who's a very veteran guy that can be your backup next year. Michael Hawkins has had an incredible spring. Uh, then you look at receiver. I think that they're they're pretty deep there. I, yeah. I don't know if they have a superstar just yet, but I do think that they it's the deepest the room has been under Brent Venables for sure. And Emmett Jones has done a good job there. And then he, the tight end room, Andy, is the one room that I would say has changed the most over the course of the last year. They've gotten some really good bodies in there. Obviously, five-star Devon Mitchell is someone to watch, but they bring in the transfer, Jake Roberts from Baylor, uh, who's a nice player, who's played a lot of football, and then Bauer Sharp. I mean, he's the he's probably kind of been, been the, the standout. The talk of the camp so yeah. far, just in terms of what he's been able to do to the tight end room that simply wasn't used a whole lot last year. I think the tight end uh, position for Oklahoma had 20 receptions a year ago. You you almost kind of feel like, I think Bauer Sharp could take care of that in a you know the first handful of games before they even go on the road to Auburn at the end of uh, September. Bauer Sharp, Southeastern Louisiana transfer. Great trust fund tight end name. You got to <laughs> like the trust fund tight ends. No doubt. Lawson he, Lucky at Georgia. That's another one. It, it, if they sound like they come with a 10 figure trust fund, I think you got to do. If they're going to be on that Sigma Nu uh, fraternity list, at, you know, down in Oxford <laughs> at some point in his career. Uh, and exactly. He's kind of too. And I, he's yeah. kind of has a fun story just coming from uh, high school where he played quarterback and it was one of those guys that uh, George wrote about on uh, Suter Scoop just in terms of was a guy that. COVID really hit him hard in his recruitment. He had to kind of find a path to uh, to really high-level football, and he's now in Norman. So he's he's really been kind of the talk of camp. Super though. athletic, uh, can run, and and is a guy that they feel like can do some some different things. And, and last year, that was a position that, I mean, Austin Stogner, you know, he was he he was a warrior in terms of playing every snap for them at tight end. He just was not very dynamic. I, I think that they're going to be a lot more dynamic at that position. And when you talk about having – you know, Seth Luttrell and Joe John Finley, you know, a guy that played uh, fullback and a guy that played tight end at Oklahoma, you would think they're going to use that position quite a bit. So we're, we're going to get a look at the the Seth Luttrell and Joe John Finley offense on Saturday. How different do you think it's going to look than the Jeff Levy offense? I think there's going to be a lot of people that walk away from uh, Saturday, particularly in a controlled scrimmage environment and go, this is the same thing that we've seen over the last couple of years, which, you know, if they could just get half of the uh, production that Dylan Gabriel and Jeff Levy got uh, over the last, you know, two years in Norman, I think that for the most part, everybody would be fine as long as they run the ball in Lawrence or as long as they uh, able to move the ball and pick up first downs in Stillwater. Uh, nobody probably would have been complaining. But at the same time, I do think that you are going to see some differences in terms of, uh, you know, just overall style of what they want to be able to do. I know that Seth uh, has been quoted as saying you could ask 10 different people in all of his different stops, whether it be in, uh, you know, Indiana or North Carolina or North Texas, and they would all probably give you 10 different answers on how you uh, characterize, uh, you know, Seth's offense overall. But at the same time, I do think that, uh, you know, you're going to want to be able to use Axon Arnold in the run game as well as uh, kind of lean on a run game, which is kind of interesting considering all the offensive line problems they've had this spring. I think the two biggest differences you're going to see, Andy, are I think the the speed, the pace at which they play. I do think they're going to slow down a little bit. That's not to say they won't do some no huddle and 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 go tempo and those sorts of things. But I mean, Oklahoma the last couple of years have been you know one of the fastest teams in college football. I do think they'll they'll slow down just a little bit on offense, and then I think the run game is where you're going to see some different things schematically. I think they'll get back to some of that GT counter and outside zone that Bill Biedenboe is, is really used to as an offensive line coach. Him and Seth Luttrell are, are obviously very close and see a lot of things similarly. They, they kind of got away from some of that stuff the last couple of years, especially last year until late in the year when they really kind of found their groove. It was They were doing more simple things in the running games. I think you're going to see that. And I just think that in terms of his play calling style, Seth Luttrell is going to want to lean on the run game in a lot of ways. And I know that he he's also known for throwing the ball around the yard, and I think you're going to see a lot of vertical passing and also some horizontal passing that we saw in the Jeff Lebby offense. But for my understanding, this spring has been a lot about trying to emphasize the run game because they knew last year they weren't good enough there. And, and in, in tight games, you have to be able to run the football. And I think that that's what they're they're gonna you're gonna see maybe the biggest difference in terms of what they're doing schematically 
is in the run game. Talk dirty yeah. to me, boys. GT counter. Love to hear it. Love to hear it. We were talking G lead sweeps yesterday with UNLV's offensive coordinator. So we're, we're just, we're, we're all over the place in the run game. We have large people moving very fast, and that's what I like to see. But it, it, it's, you, the point you bring up is good, though, because I just feel like tempo at this point has to be variable. Like you have to be able to dial it up, dial it down, depending on what you need. I feel like the teams that only run at one pace, whether that be slow or fast, it, it's almost like in baseball, like a hitter can time up a hundred mile an hour fastball. It's that's all you can throw. But if you've got an 83 mile an hour change up that has a little drop to it, he's screwed. Yeah. And, and, and I would say too, Andy, part of the issue with OU's offense the last couple of years is it felt like they were just running tempo to try and catch the defense off guard. And it was a fourth and one and they'd rush to the line instead of just saying, Hey, we're, it's going to be fourth and one. We're just going to run the ball down right. the throw. And I think that, I think there's a lot of Oklahoma fans over the last couple of years, particularly they would have been more comfortable in third and 13 yes. than they probably were in third and short or fourth <laughs> and one, which is just insane. Yeah. yeah. And, I think that that's the biggest thing with the tempo is like it felt like at times they were just running it to try and get the defense off guard. And that was kind of their identity. And I think they're going to go back to again. Seth Luttrell is going to run some tempo. He, he did it North Texas. He did it North Carolina when he was the OC, Indiana, all those places. But I, I think there's a time and place for it. And uh, I don't think it's going to be one of those situations where they're just every possession is, a, you know, a minute or two minutes long um, like it was under Jeff Levy. Now, Jackson Arnold. He's the guy. We know that. They let Dylan Gabriel go to Oregon. How's he coming along? What where does he need to work? And and where is he where he needs to be? It's the most fascinating conversation I think that nobody wants to have in Norman. Uh, just in terms of what his development has been when we saw him on the field in the Alamo Bowl. It obviously there was some really, really good. But on the bat, on the flip side of that, there was some bad. I mean, you obviously you turn the ball over six times. You're not going to win very many games, uh, you know, whether it be home or away next season in the SEC. And I think that uh, just decision making, uh, you know, I, we talked to some of the players and uh, they I, I think it was Jaden Gibson on uh, last week when we talked to him on Friday, just in terms of he's been really good about bouncing back and forgetting some of the bad throws. And it's like, well, how many of those bad throws have there been? With that said, I still think that there is a uh, feeling, there's a belief around Norman that he's going to be the next great Oklahoma quarterback. Uh, there, there's obvious tools and you know some of the stuff that in some of the throws that he made in San Antonio against Arizona. But it's going to be interesting to, to me, at least going into this next season, how you navigate those freshman ups and downs that are still going to come, even despite him still being in Norman for having uh, you know a game under his belt and having played periodically throughout the year, specifically, uh, you know, coming in Provo and things like that. So the the good is really, really good. I think it's going to be about how quickly he can get over some of these missteps, how quickly you can get over a, a turnover, whether it be in Auburn or Oxford or Columbia or wherever next season. Uh, you're going to have to probably rely on a defense that, you know, again, as we were talking about, they return so many guys. There's a belief that they could take that next step under Brent on the defensive side. What, what have you thought, George? Yeah, I, you know, the latest scrimmage, Andy, uh, we heard that Arnold threw two touchdowns and he also threw two interceptions. And I think he's going to have games like that next year where you're like, man, this guy is on fire and he's 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 dealing and then he makes a couple bad mistakes. And and that that's going to happen. And that's just some of the growing pains when you have, you know, a 19 year old, 20 year old at quarterback. But I think that his ceiling is still incredibly high when you when you talk about the ability to throw the football, the accuracy. Uh, all of those things, arm strength, he's got all of that. I think his ability to run, we're going to see a lot of that next year too. And I think that's going to be a part of what they're doing uh, schematically. But I think that it's just going to be a growing process for him next year. And I think that fans need to be patient with him because I think he'll get better as the season goes on. The only problem is the opponents get a lot better as the season goes on for Oklahoma. So um, I, I still have a lot of faith in, faith in him. I just think that people need to be ready for him to turn the ball over a few times. I think the biggest thing for him right now is trusting in the offensive line, which is a tough thing to do when they're constantly rotating guys and, and trying to figure out who their best five are. I think if he can trust that offensive line and stay in that pocket, he's going to make good decisions. It's when he feels like he can't and he has to make a, a, a you know a quick decision or a decision too early and he maybe makes the wrong decision. So um, I think that that's all part of the growing process. And, and look, we just haven't heard a whole lot of 
oh, Jackson Arnold's been amazing, but we also haven't heard Jackson Arnold's been terrible. Yeah, I don't fall, think anybody's worried camp. that he's going to be a bust as much yeah. as it, they're just going to have to kind of grow through some of uh, the growing pains that do happen for a freshman quarterback, which I think for Oklahoma fans in a way, because they've been so blessed by the transfer portal, you know, dating all the way back to Baker, Baker, Kyler, Jalen, Dylan, <laughs> they were all really, really good about the turnover issue. There was never yep. a turnover issue in Norman. I think that that's going to be kind of the biggest hurdle in between this team being, I think, decently pretty good. And maybe you're having to battle and, uh, you know, win a couple of these coin flip games that we've talked to you about before, Andy. So was the last it regular Oklahoma quarterback starter who was recruited by Oklahoma out of high school, Trevor Knight? Yeah. Well, Rattler. Well, yeah, I no, guess Spencer Rattler. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Spencer Rattler. That's no, 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 Williams, so have memory too. hold that. Memory hold 2022. Golly. 2021. Excuse me. Yeah. It, God, it seems like so long ago, but yes. Wow. 20, 20 so and 21 the, have been like just completely ex yeah, from the Oklahoma like out. aisle system outside Other than of OU the 21 Texas. OU Texas yeah, game. Yeah. 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 Man. But you're right. I mean, they have had so many good portal quarterbacks, but. They've also just had so many good quarterbacks because I don't I, Spencer Rattler was a good quarterback. It just wasn't Caleb Williams. And I think that, you know, at first people thought that that meant he wasn't very good. It turns out he's actually pretty good. And we'll see that probably in the draft. But uh, yeah, this is, it's an amazing lineage they got going there, but I, it, it's easy to forget that most of those guys did come from somewhere else. So uh, good luck with the homegrown Jackson Arnold and uh, you know, maybe a little bit of a roller coaster. Get the get the free preview on Saturday, boys. Thank you so much. Andy, appreciate it. Thanks, Andy. There's your update on the Sooners and the Longhorns as they get ready to go into the SEC. I'm very excited about this. Like when I saw the, the SEC logo on the Texas jersey when Travis Scott was at practice, like that's it. It did start to feel more real. And the Oklahoma thing, yeah, they have got to figure out the offensive line situation. It's it's tough when you lose that many good players, especially going into a year when you're going into a league where your schedule will depend on how well you play at the line of scrimmage. But it, it is interesting to hear the guys talk about, you know, maybe a little little young depth on the D line like David Stone. Like, can he make an immediate impact? He's not going to be relied upon to be a starter right away, but can he make an impact right away? We'll find out and should get a nice little preview of that this weekend with the Sooners. One more thing before we go. We got to talk about Michigan and the NCAA and Jim Harbaugh. Yeah, Jim Harbaugh has gone to the NFL, but he, he remains with us in spirit, if not in, well, there's an NCAA case still. But Michigan and the NCAA reached a settlement on one of the cases that we talked about a lot of last season. Not the other one. Clayton Safety from the Wolverine joined us to discuss what that means for Michigan and for Jim Harbaugh. We're digesting what appears to be the resolution of Cheeseburger Gate. That would be the case with Michigan and the NCAA, not the one we were talking about all last fall. Well, at the beginning of last fall. But this is not the Connor Stallions sign stealing accusation case. This is the one that dates back to 2020 during the pandemic. Uh, Jim Harbaugh accused of meeting some players for a cheeseburger, plus some other things that were going on at the same time uh, that allegedly violated NCAA recruiting rules. There has been a settlement, and Clayton Safey from the Wolverine joins us. So, Michigan, multiple assistant coaches at the time have settled, and Jim Harbaugh has not. Does that about sum it up? Yeah, it seems that way. And obviously, the NCAA's uh, release was pretty vague as well. They didn't even name Jim Harbaugh, even though they said the former head coach, so we all know who that is. But like you said, they said uh, you know current or former coaches. There were five of them uh, that could receive – or will receive uh, show causes from the NCAA, and they didn't name them. I think one of them might be Mike McDonald, who's now the head coach of the Seattle Seahawks. So some of these guys are gone, and Michigan did clarify today as well that there won't be current coaches 
that will receive game suspension. So we won't see something like we saw a year ago when Sharon Moore, who was the offensive coordinator at the time, served a one-game suspension as part of a negotiated resolution with the NCAA. No current coaches on Michigan staff will miss games for this. The other, um, you know, the the other punishments basically are three years of probation, a fine of an undisclosed amount. Not sure that that's going to really harm Michigan all that much. They said recruiting restrictions, which is pretty vague as well. We know last year they self-imposed uh, two weeks of having no recruits on campus for games. It could be something similar there or, or just, you know, less time, uh, you know, on the road or, or whatever it would be, less visit weekends. So, again, not too many details by the NCAA, but it feels like pretty much a slap on the wrist and then uh, wait and see on what exactly happens to Jim Harbaugh. Yeah, and we'll see what they actually are because not all show causes are created equal. Essentially, what show cause means is if you were to hire this coach or to continue to employ this coach, you have to show the committee why you are doing that. But they also attack on a penalty or two. And, and a lot of times the penalties are related to the violation. So it may be that this coach can't go on the road in April or this coach uh, can't go on the road in November. And that's a lot of times how they deal with this stuff. And as you mentioned, some of these guys are in the NFL. You know, Jay Harbaugh is an NFL assistant now. Uh, Mike McDonald is is the Seattle Seahawks head coach. Uh, <laughs> Jim Harbaugh, of course, is the is the Chargers head coach, and so it doesn't really affect them at all. We had there was the weird situation with Jim Tressel, where right after he got run out of Ohio State, and the NCAA was going to penalize him and suspend him for games, uh, he was going to consult with an NFL team, and they were going to make him sit games like. That's not going to happen here. For for example, Antonio Pierce is also under investigation by the NCAA for stuff that happened at Arizona State. He is the Raiders head coach. Nothing's going to happen to him from the NCAA. So, uh, or at least nothing that'll affect him as the Raiders coach. So nothing that's going to affect Jim Harbaugh or Mike McDonald if you are worried about that Chargers or Seahawks fans. Yeah, there was a report. Do you remember this? Like middle of last year? Oh, um, yeah. Even before? I can't even remember because it was so crazy. But I think it was even before the Connor Stallions investigation where basically it was like if Jim Harbaugh is going to, and this was from NFL Network, I think, if he's going to go to the NFL, they could do the Jim Trestle thing to him. And it was like, even at the time, it was like, I, I, I just don't know about that. I don't know that the NFL cares about the quote unquote rule breaking in a sport in, of college football that there really are no rules, you know, at this point, I know you've right. Covered... Now, yeah. the, a lot of the rules that they're trying to enforce no longer exist. Uh, those, and th those rules that we're talking about in this particular case, a lot of them were unique to the pandemic. It was a lot of, you can't have people visiting your campus. You can't go visit them off campus, that sort of thing during the pandemic. So this is all a fairly unique situation. And again, it does not affect anything that's going on with the case involving Connor Stallions, the accusations of signal stealing. That case, as far as I know, Clayton, is still ongoing. Uh, I, I talked to somebody who's tangentially involved with that a few weeks ago, and it sounds like it's moving very slowly. And I don't know that there's going to be any anything going on with that anytime soon. Yeah, and that's not a huge surprise given how the NCAA moves, as we know. Um, I think it's we're like almost 150 days since they opened an investigation on who the hell was on the uh, the Central Michigan sideline for the Michigan State game. <laughs> Never going to figure it out. <laughs> right. We just don't know who that guy was wearing CMU gear and uh, Nike shoes with an Adidas logo taped over him or whatever it was. So I, I believe they were on shoes. I, I So we got another oh. shoe brand. Like – which may have been a violation of somebody else's shoe deal. Who knows? Right, right. but whoever who, that was, who can, probably... who can possibly know? Because we don't know who that person was. No, 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 <laughs> exactly. So, no, it, it's a good point to make because it can get a little confusing when you got a couple NCAA investigations going on, but has nothing to do with that. Um, and you know, Andy, you and I were texting earlier in the day when I was asking you a couple questions because you've obviously covered you know more of this nationally than than we have as as local reporters, but. Uh, you know, then, then we're talking about the Jim Harbaugh situation where, like, it won't really affect him, as you said, or Mike McDonald or any of these guys that are no longer in college football. But to me, I've always thought of Jim Harbaugh as a guy who's going to coach pretty much until he dies. He actually has said that. Um, he, he's definitely said that. Yeah, he, he has said that. And, like, 
at some point, does he end up back at some college job and, you know, whatever, just for the love of the game? Could it affect him then? Will the NCAA exist by that point is a big question. <laughs> I didn't as well. think about it that way, but you, you're exactly right. And so Jim Harbaugh is 60. He's starting a job with the Chargers. Now, famously, Jim Harbaugh tends to burn bright and burn out at, at various yeah. places. Now, he stayed at Michigan a lot longer than any other place, but I would argue that he actually had two separate tenures at Michigan. And that's probably why. Yeah, two separate tenures. It was his alma mater. You know, people here love him, obviously. I mean, he was a you know Heisman finalist as a player. He comes back. You know, he was a great coach. So different circumstances here than in San Francisco, for example, where he stayed four years. And they pretty much showed him the door after he took him to three NFC championship games and a Super Bowl. So how bad do you have to be to do that, by the way? <laughs> exactly. So. Um, and you know, you can argue whatever side you want and, and who has the facts straight or who doesn't. Um, but the fact is that happened. So to me, and this is just kind of projecting down the road. Like I just have a theory that he's at some point going to come back to college. I mean, we have Bill Belichick out there who is not employed right now because of the way the NFL has gone. Could Jim Harbaugh coach UCLA, you know, in, in eight years or something like that, when things uh, are done in, in LA, who knows, it doesn't really matter at this point. Um, again, the NCAA may not exist, but it's just something to think about because he's going to, he's pretty much the only one that is still involved with the NCAA at this point. Michigan's reached its uh, resolution. It'll serve its punishment, but Jim Harbaugh is going to, I think, continue to fight. And I guess we haven't maybe no, uh, noted the exact reason why is because he's facing a level one allegation right now uh, for quote unquote misleading or failing to cooperate with investigators about these rather minor violations. So, right. We don't know what he said in these meetings with the NCAA, but the fact is, whatever he did or said or didn't say, um, they took as not cooperating. And, you know, he's a very, you know, stubborn guy, principled guy. And I think that he's probably going to fight this, even though he's not in college football at this point. Yeah, he he's retained Tom Mars, who, who's an attorney who's worked with a lot of different coaches and players the last few years and, and become kind of a thorn in the side of the NCAA. Uh from the NCAA's release. So yeah, it is. it does feel like this is a lot being dumped on Harbaugh. The negotiated resolution also involved the school's agreement that the underlying violations determined a head coach responsibility violation and the former head football head coach failed to meet his responsibility to cooperate with the investigation. That is essentially Michigan saying, we, we stipulate that. I don't think Jim Harbaugh is real thrilled about that. I, I reached out to Tom Mars, his attorney, uh, who said that it... Michigan and the NCAA did not talk to either him or Jim Harbaugh about this before this resolution was reached. So uh, my guess is Jim Harbaugh keeps fighting. My guess is he keeps paying Tom Mars uh, billable hours and hopes that Tom Mars remains a thorn in the side of the NCAA. And that could be funny because, again, yeah. it can't really hurt Jim Harbaugh. And as you pointed out, he's 60 right now. Let's say... At age 66, he's won a Super Bowl and, and things have gone great. And he decides, okay, uh, Justin Herbert, he's getting old. It's time to go do something else. And he's like, yeah, I like living here. I'm going to coach UCLA. I would imagine you can probably make that work. Like Bruce Pearl was still under a show cause when Auburn hired him to coach their basketball team. He then had them in the final four not long after. So it is possible that all of this can can be worked out ultimately, but it will be very funny to watch Jim Harbaugh battle the NCAA, whether it's he's actually taking part or his attorney is just throwing the punches, while Jim Harbaugh can't actually be hurt by the NCAA. Right. It's kind of uh it's kind of the perfect storm in that way because he can actually throw punches now, and you know, they don't really have a way of punching back immediately. And I do think, and you and I have probably talked about this on air, you know, back in the the other investigation in, in the late last season, he kind of enjoys a fight. He kind of enjoys conflict. So, uh, and he certainly has enough money, especially now with a reported 16 million a year or whatever it is from the Chargers. <laughs> yeah, I don't know Tom what Tom's Martin, charging, man. but he could probably raise it. I exactly. So that'll, it'll just be something to follow. Uh, but again, you know, in terms of Michigan and the impact, you know, short-term, long-term on, on the Wolverines, shouldn't be you know too big of a deal as they enter this new era and you understand it from michigan too trying to cover its itself and set sharon more up you know early on in his career here to not have to worry about this stuff 
as they move forward. All right. So except for Jim Harbaugh, who probably will enjoy the fight, Cheeseburger Gate has been laid to rest. It's kind of now sad. bring on Connor Stallions Gate or whatever <laughs> word, whatever whatever word you would like me to attach Gate to, because people robbed the Watergate Hotel and not a Chick Fil A. <laughs> That's why. Thank you so much for watching, Clayton. Thank you. Appreciate it. No, I I don't think there were any Chick Fil A's in Washington D.C. in 1972. So, uh, but that is why we attach gate to everything because that is a particular hotel where the stuff happened. And yet we have to attach gate to every scandal. Don't ask me. I didn't make the rules. I just follow them. But the rules of this show are that when we wrap on Wednesday, we ask you to help us out for Thursday because my favorite episode of the week is coming up because you ask the questions and I answer them. We've already gotten a couple of really good questions that have come in through the email this week, but we can always use more. Tomorrow is a Dear Andy show. Whether it's the DOA Super League, the transfer portal, the NFL draft, you name it, we have all kinds of things to talk about. So you can find me on social media, Andy underscore Staples on Twitter or on Instagram. You can also email me, Andy Staples on three at gmail.com. And if you got an epic question, maybe put it on video. Our friend Nathan. He sends us one just about every week. Love your questions. We have so much to talk about right now. There's so much going on. Andy Staples on three at gmail.com. Andy underscore Staples on social media. Get those questions in and we will talk about it all. We'll talk to you tomorrow.